I wrote you a letter, and I'm pretty sure it goes something like this. A letter to you, perpetually blagging your way through life. You who feel like a fraud, a misconceived mishmash of half-baked beliefs, cut and paste archetypes. Breathe easy. We must all play this game of identity Jenga. To the young black girl stood in the furthest corner of the dance floor, whose heart marches to the urgent bark of David Bowie and Joe Strummer, who doesn't know how to dutty wine, whose behind is as flat as an extended palm, who feels more at home in the screaming mouth of a mosh pit than a dance hall rave. To the boys who've been known to kiss boys, and the girls who've been known to kiss girls, may your casual caress of your lover's shoulder be an everyday gesture of affection, not a willful act of defiance. To the boys in pink tutus and the girls in Superman costumes and the he, she, almost not quite delicious anarchist in-betweeners who refuse our pronouns and prerequisites so we know what it is to choke on the trapped air of ignorance. To the 16 stone man who has no time for the condescending thumbs up swung his way as he bites into an apple or runs round his local park. Here's to the hipster too afraid to tell her friends how much she loves One Direction. <laughs> no, not ironically. With a grotesquely fierce and unending passion, here's to the feminist who read the beauty myth three times yet still lusts after xylophone ribs and guillotine cheekbones, who loves hip hop with a full heart and gritted teeth. Here's to the people who have at least 16 different responses to the question, where are you from? The guts that double dutch as their pen hovers over the ethnicity box on a medical form. The stomachs that bloat with the oceans their parents crisped and crossed. The accents that lilt and swell like an orgy of castanets nibbling at sitars and African drums. Here's to the people that belong everywhere and nowhere. The tongues parched and gasping as a land of exile. Here's to the 30, 40, 50, 60 year old people still working it all out who rip off the hands off the ticking clock and eat them like breadsticks. Here's to taking your own sweet time. Here's to the ways of being and seeing and living and loving that our feeble language has yet to find a battle cry for. Here's to the civil war raging inside all of us the gristle of contradictions we pluck from our teeth and the small truths we nestle safely under our tongues. Here's to falling and failing and flying all at once. Here's to identity, Jenga. Even the tallest and most formidable of towers was once just a pile of bricks. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, this is insane. Um, so people will often say that being a good performer is about being really confident. Confidence. I kind of hate that word, you know. I think it's become this really trite self-help term that we like to fling about with reckless abandon. But what do we actually mean by that? And usually when people use the word confident, they mean slick, self-assured, unshakable. I don't know about you, but I have been blundering my way through life for the past 24 years, and I'm probably going to carry on like that for the foreseeable future. And, you know, I've, I've always been loud and talkative and uninhibited, but not because I'm any more self-assured than you or anyone else on the planet. Let's be quite clear here. I haven't got a freaking clue what I'm doing. <laughs> like, like, ever. <laughs> but here's the thing. I utilize that. I embrace that. I take the very thing that should make me a lesser performer and indeed human, and I use it to my advantage. And I think that's because in spoken word, honesty is the thing that we're valuing the most. And I think people go to a poetry show because they want to see something they're not seeing on television or in the cinema or in any of our mass media today. And what is that thing? Well, I'm going to unpack that a little bit as we think about this subject of what if. So I've been thinking about technology and how we're all freaking out at the way things are progressing. And it's becoming apparent the exponential rate of technology's advancement is so unprecedented that even experts in the field can't give us a conclusive idea of where we might be in 10 years' time. Now, me as a writer and performer, I didn't think this affected me directly until I started hearing all these conjectures about machines one day independently composing music or making paintings, writing novels or even poems. And that's where I'm like, okay. 
robots are after my job, it's on. And, uh, you know, this is a, this is a really interesting and, and scary prospect for me, yes, but for society at large. What if robots could create art? Now, the scientific implications of that are fascinating, of course, but I want to focus on what that suggests about how we view art as a society. This idea of robots creating art, I think, is indicative of the bottom line that capitalism is inevitably focused on. The idea that everything, including our emotions and our modes of expression, could be commodified and thus created to be more easily produced and consumed is a really frightening extension of the values that this economic system has instilled in us. And I want to share a really pertinent example of how this manifests where I live in the UK. So part of my job is going into schools all over England and running poetry workshops, and I absolutely love it. As far as I'm concerned, one of the best things that I can do is facilitate the ability to write and tell stories for children and young people. But I've found that recently my work is depleting. Less and less schools are opting to give their pupils access to these activities. Now, why is that? Well, in the wake of the economic crisis, I think the UK is experiencing what I would call a dismissal of the arts. Creative subjects are having their funding cut in loads of state schools, and even where those subjects are still available, pupils are implicitly and explicitly discouraged from pursuing them. You'll often hear people say things like, oh, kids only take those topics for an easy A, or those topics aren't academic subjects, they're hobbies. But of course, in private schools, where the funding streams are exclusive, the pupils still have access to these hobbies, and topics and activities. But these kids aren't the vast majority. So for the most part, we're creating a generation of young people who are detached from the arts and its capabilities. Now, the common argument would be that we could unwittingly be depriving the world of potential artistic genius. But I think this is still a focus on the conventional consumer return of an investment. I mean, what are we really telling our youth when we tell them they can only pursue arts if they can afford to, or if they intend to be exceptional or brilliant? Well, we're telling them that artists who are worth a lot of money or have high cultural standing are the ones that are important. Now, not every kid with a paintbrush is a potential Picasso, and not every kid with a keyboard is the next Stevie Wonder, but I think that grossly misses the point. At the end of the day, we should be teaching our young people to create because it's an honest and cathartic expression of how they feel about the world around them, and it's separate from the prescriptive ideals they're being taught in many of the other classrooms. So let's not focus on what we want the kids to gain through this, how they're going to contribute to the economy through doing the arts, but what they're getting through that therapeutically. I think that's something that we really, really need to focus on more when we're thinking about why we should keep the arts in schools today. So let's think about this idea a little more and how this manifests in our society at large. Let's think about how I see in the disengaged eyes of young teenage boys that they don't believe in what the arts can do for them. I often hear boys tell me, oh, I don't want to do this workshop. Poetry is gay. <laughs> I quote. And what's really frustrating is th about that is that they haven't been taught how to articulate their emotions in a healthy way. So instead, they tend to express themselves through sullenness or anger or violence. And I see the effects of this in how effusively we talk of our economic crisis, yet remain woefully inarticulate on the mental health issues that are slowly but surely killing us. I see it in a generation of young musicians who think the only way their talent is worth something is if they win X Factor or gain millions of hits on YouTube and will just replicate generic models of what's popular to achieve that rather than searching for their own artistic integrity. I see it in how art and culture is placed on a high shelf where only the rich and privileged can access it. And when we have a system like that, that means the stories that get told do not express the multitude of our experience. So let's think back to when we were younger and how we used to create. Do you remember when you were a really young child how much joy you would get from coloring in pictures? Do you remember once ever really caring about whether it was good or not? Of course not. It was about getting as many colors on the page as possible with as many utensils as possible, right? And it would look as if a rainbow had vomited all over your paper, but it didn't matter. <laughs> because that joy you felt was just complete and pure and wonderful. But then as you get a bit older, the teacher tells you, you know, coloring inside the lines is neater. And you start to fret and get self-critical and anxious. You look over at the kid next to you and convince yourself that their work is better. You go home fighting back tears because the teacher didn't give you a gold star for your drawing. And that feeling of joy that you once felt is lost, potentially forever. 
And that's exactly what I'm trying to push against in the classroom. And kids find it intoxicating when I tell them that perfection is irrelevant, that I just want to hear their stories. So we can write whatever we want, <laughs> they ask incredulously. And the simple answer I give them, yes, is a key to a freedom and a self-actualization that we steal from them every time we tell them that art is for the gifted or the chosen. So, maybe one day robots could create art, but what kind of art would it be? Robots can, for the most part, work with recurring patterns and churn out product based on an established algorithm. So that can only ever be based on what has been before. Robots cannot facilitate the stories that are yet to be told, and we're in desperate need of those stories. I don't know whether you are one of countless people on this planet desperately searching for a reflection of yourself. If you are, you know what it is to feel as if there are little to no stories out there that make you feel less alone in your plight. So if the robots out there are going to be telling the stories that have already been told again and again, what are the stories that we still need to hear, the voices that are still silenced? I want to think a lot about those as I go forward in my work and think about the people that I want to give that platform. And I think it's really important that when we think about robots creating art, we remember that it should only ever be to facilitate the things that we haven't yet seen. And so, in times of economic and political disparity, it's a really common byproduct that supporting arts and culture is considered frivolous. But I believe it is now that we need the arts more than ever. And the inconstancy of the world we live in shows that nothing is certain and nothing is fixed. We can't know what the economy will do or where technology will take us in five, 10, or 20 years' time. In short, we don't have a clue what we're doing. Let's embrace that. Let's express that. Only the documents that we leave of these times will last and help us retain what makes us human in an increasingly alienating world. Thank you.